across the Great Lakes region, water systems are aging, and that means looming costs to maintain critical infrastructure. To prevent more water crises and keep our water safe, we'll all need to pay, but many households already find water unaffordable. As the nation embarks on historic infrastructure upgrades, the Great Lakes News Collaborative digs in to uncover water's true cost. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for our Water's True Cost event. We're so thrilled to see so many of your of your uh, your Zoom ins to this discussion, which I think is going to be a really excellent one. And we're so pleased to see all of you. Uh, in this hour, we will look at Michigan's water funding and how water Michigan's water funding and maintenance issues play out in cities big and small, as well as at the tap for water customers. Our special guests today are Tim Newman, Executive Director of the Michigan Rural Water Association, Bonifer Ballard, Executive Director of the Michigan Section of the American Water Works Association, and Nina Sassi, Policy and Planning Director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Today's conversation is moderated by Kelly House, Bridge Environmental Reporter, and Brett Walton of Circle of Blue. You can read the full biographies of each of our panelists on the Eventbrite registration page, and I will share that link in the chat momentarily. This event is in partnership with Circle of Blue and is funded by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation and the Bosch Community Fund. Thank you so much for your support. This event is also part of the Water's True Cost series created by the Great Lakes News Collaborative. The Great Lakes News Collaborative includes Bridge, Michigan, Circle of Blue, Great Lakes Now at Detroit Public Television and Michigan Radio, Michigan's NPR news leader, who work together to bring audiences news and information about the impact of climate change, pollution, and aging infrastructure on the Great Lakes and drinking water. This independent journalism is supported by the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Our conversation will begin in just a moment, and Brett and Kelly will lead the, lead the discussion with our panel for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll turn to your questions. Please type any questions you have for our panelists in the chat at any time. We are recording today's conversation and it will be posted on Bridge Michigan this week. You can subscribe to our daily or our Environment Watch newsletter by visiting www.bridgemi.com and clicking the subscribe button. Events like this one are made possible by the support of Bridge members. If you'd like to join our membership community, we'll drop a link to do so in the chat. As a reminder, please stay muted throughout this session. Before we dive into our conversation, I'd like to pass the virtual microphone to Carl Ganter, co-founder and director of Circle of Blue, for a brief introduction and a very special video scene setter for this important conversation. Well, thanks so much, Amber. And we're really excited to be working with Bridge and other members of the Great Lakes News Collaborative and Michigan Radio and Detroit Public Television's Great Lakes Now. And we couldn't be in a more important moment to be talking about water because the Great Lakes face big challenges and they're a bellwether for how the nation and the world will manage its water crises. And there are many from climate change that is triggering or exacerbating droughts in India, Europe and the American West to groundwater contaminated by chemicals like PFAS and nitrate. And at Circle of Blue, we're covering these stories across the nation and around the world. But here in the Great Lakes, we are defining water's future the News Collaborative is on the front lines, revealing stories like climate impacts, asking questions like, will the Great Lakes become a climate refuge? And to what we're talking about today, what is water's true cost? And how can communities cope and make access to safe water equitable? And as you'll hear more today, the water bill is coming due. How do we build and update the systems that treat and deliver our water? And who will pay the cost? So to start us off, I spoke earlier with George Hawkins, an expert on national water systems and innovation, and he serves on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, advising the White House on infrastructure policy. Greetings, my name is George Hawkins, and I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm the executive director of Moonshot Missions, which is a nonprofit organization that helps small and underserved communities improve their water services. But I've also been a state regulator, a federal regulator, and I've run a very large water utility, DC Water in Washington, DC, and community groups. So I've seen these issues from a lot of angles. And here's the point. 
What we know in the United States today, across the country, rural and urban, is we have water systems that were built decades ago, often in the construction grants program from the 1972 Clean Water Act, that are now in decrepit condition. And those decrepit conditions are both threatening our water quality, are incredibly expensive to resolve, and need to be done now. And here's the challenge. The estimate for the underspend on capital for water infrastructure in the United States is $81 billion a year. That's an enormous number. And you equate that to the services and the lost water and the loss of service in places like Flint. There's all sorts of elements to the story in Flint, but that's also a story of a community that was trying to save money with its low income population and made terrible decisions as a result. But there's lots of communities feeling that same pressure. How do we update these old systems when we have low income communities and families that have a hard time affording their bills? Well, the good news on a national basis, as we know, is there's two and three statutes that have come forward, the American Rescue Plan and then the bipartisan infrastructure law that will channel more money into the improvement of water infrastructure than we have seen in a generation, literally since the construction grants program of the 1972 Clean Water Act. It's $55 billion over five years under the bipartisan infrastructure law. We've never seen that kind of funding. But remember that first number I mentioned, $81 billion a year shortfall each year. So the $55 billion is a wonderful investment, but it's not enough to even cover the shortfall in one year. What does that mean for us today and what you're gonna be discussing? It's not just how much, it's how we spend the money and with whom. Historically, federal money has not gone to small and underserved communities because it's very complicated to submit, prepare, and engage on these federal funding programs. We need to solve that. And second, how the money is spent to permanently reduce operating costs, permanently targeted capital, so we bring down that $81 billion number is possible today. We're on the cusp of digital revolution and new technologies that can permanently reduce the cost of water services if we invest wisely. So you're in the right place at the right time with the right people to evaluate these questions today and have the opportunity to channel this federal funding to the people who need it most in the projects that will deliver the protections for the next 50 years that we know are needed today. Thanks so very much. So George Hawkins emphatically set the scene and what's at stake for the nation. And George notes how far behind we really are. But to help put this in Great Lakes context, we have an amazing panel today, and it's moderated by Kelly House, environment reporter from Bridge, Michigan, and Brett Walton, senior reporter at Circle of Blue. So over to you guys. Thanks, Carl, and thanks to our speakers and everyone else for being here today. Um, I think Brett and I are just going to kind of trade off questions um, over the next few minutes. So. First one goes to Bonifer, um, and as a reminder to, to viewers, um, Bonifer is executive director of the American Water Works Association Michigan section. So, you know, you have kind of this um, landscape scale view of what's going on in Michigan, and it's no secret that our infrastructure, water infrastructure has some problems. Um, it gets a D from the American Society of Civil Engineers. And until the big recent spike in inflation, water costs were rising um, faster than the rate of inflation and taking up a bigger chunk of the average person's paycheck. Um, and we know from the 21st Century Infrastructure Task Force that digging out of that backlog could take at least a billion dollars annually for um, decades. From you, I'm interested in you know just this question of how did it get this bad? How did we get where we are today? Well, I, I like to use the analogy of owning a house, right? You think about the first time you bought a house, it takes a large down payment, you make this big investment and you wanna protect that investment. So any responsible homeowner is gonna make plans to uh, you know, replace the windows, to repair the roof, to make sure you can replace appliances. And if you don't do that, you're gonna end up in crisis with your own home. It's very similar to the water systems. We put them in place. We had this great amount of funding when we first established the water community systems. Uh, and here we are decades later, not having done the right planning or the right maintenance. Now that's, it's a, a sweeping statement. I do wanna acknowledge there are plenty of systems out there that are doing things correctly. Um, 
But the reality is we've had artificially low water rates for a long time. And that's partially um, why you saw water rates going up just before inflation started to increase. Uh, we're really just right rating um, at this point, but we can't continue with just that, that process. Um, uh, George's remarks in the uh, opening remarks about um, being able to, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, to be able to um, actually put this money to work in a, in a wise way uh, and the difficulty in uh, having access to funding with some of the smaller systems, that is a real problem. And uh, recently we have, there's actually a bill in the Michigan House right now that will revise the state water, um, I'm sorry, the state revolving fund that will make it easier for small systems to access that money. Um, so that's a pretty big step forward, but I'll stop there. All right, well, pipes and pumps are the center of a water system, but we have to look also at who is at the end of those pipes and pumps, and that is delivering water to people. And infrastructure and management failures have a direct impact on human health. I wanna bring in Nina Sassi into the conversation now. Nina is with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and in the past has served as a clean water advocate for Michigan. Uh, Nina, in your role, uh, what is the Department of Health and Human Services doing to connect water access and affordability to public health policy? How are you linking these two together? So thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here to talk about bridging these things together. Um, what we're doing in this space is looking at social determinants of health. And for folks that may not be familiar with that terminology, but we're looking at those social and environmental factors that influence health outcomes. So not being reactive in treating chronic disease or you know, the end result of this long life of disparities, but really thinking about how we can go more upstream. So as you think about housing and water access and so many other social structures that influence both water and just health, we're thinking about how collectively these things come together. And we recently launched our social determinants of health strategy just last month. And it's a statewide framework that will allow us to think more collectively and collaborate at regional levels and just think about again, who we have at the table as we're having these conversations. I like to go back to Bonifer's question and her answer and use it. I was such a great analogy of a house and having the money to invest in it. You know, for, for small rural communities and EJ communities, you know, thinking about, again, that, that house that you have, and if you have, you know, the technical assistance, if you have the funding to invest in it, the resources needed to, to sustain it, we know that there is just a number of inequities that have resulted due to, you know, very um, sometimes racial and, and otherwise um, systemic inequities um, ingrained in our culture that have influenced these things. And so we're looking at, again, how we can be proactive as state partners to make sure that our funding and resources reduce these disparities. So as I think about, again, what we can do in this realm when it comes to health partners in this space, we're looking at what are some of the tools that we can bring to this space? And one example I like to give of that is like, you know, we have our Medicaid health payers, and we know that there's a huge population that exists in vulnerable um, communities um, that, for the most part, experience these water quality and affordability issues. How can we utilize some of that funding to support community and support the residents there? Again, we're looking for those ways of bringing different people to the table and understanding that within a community that faces these challenges, there's a number of other challenges that they are facing. So how can we collectively come together and be more impactful as state partners in this space? So I'm really excited about this strategy. It is not, you know, I'm not gonna assume that it's gonna fix all of our issues, but again, it creates the space for us to collaborate as state agencies and look at, you know, again, regulations from EGO, economic developments from MEDC, the health perspective um, from MDHHS and collectively how we can be more supportive of community. Um, I wanna kick it over to Tim Newman uh, with the Michigan Rural Water Association. Tim, your members are rural water providers. <clears throat> we know that many of them are struggling from um, the same you know, backlog issues that, that Bonifer was talking about, but there's money on the way. You know, um, 
Governor Whitmer and lawmakers just negotiated an infrastructure spending package that contains a billion dollars um, for drinking water improvements. There's more money uh, that I know a lot of communities are planning to spend from the COVID stimulus, uh, a federal stimulus on water. How revolutionary or not is the combined weight of those new funding sources in terms of the scale of the problem for the water providers that you represent? Um, yeah, thanks, Kelly. Uh, appreciate uh, everybody having me here. Uh, it is, it's, it's huge. Uh, this, I, I view this as a down payment, um, really, uh, this funding towards what we ultimately need overall. You know, even as a statewide, they say we got about $800 million shortage a year for water and wastewater. Right now, it's been ongoing. You know, an estimated total, which is probably even higher, and this is from a few years ago, like 13 plus billion for water, wastewater infrastructure. Um, so it's a major challenge, but this is a huge down payment. But the big thing is, you know, sometimes in the past with funding, there's been issues, and then Bonifer brought this up where, you know, they're building the house to revamp the revolving loan funds to make it easier access for smaller communities. It is, these smaller communities have fewer employees, um, fewer staff, fewer specialists. They're not able to access some of this funding. So, you know, really help these communities. We're going to need to really target this funding that's coming through um, that we haven't seen in our life, you know, a lot of our lifetimes. Uh, that make it easy for these communities to be able to access these funds um, for them to make the infrastructure improvements and everything that they will need in their their systems. Because without you know specific guidance or focus geared towards that, this funding get there, they might get overlooked. And sometimes that's what happens with the revolving loan fund stuff now is they get overlooked and it goes to large communities, which huge need there. But the smaller communities, you know, they have fewer resources available to them because um, they're typically unable to bond for themselves just because of their economies of scale and the size of their customer base, you know, they're not able to go out and bond on their own and those access. So, so this is, you know, could be very important and huge and revolutionary for these small communities, but still, it's still only a down payment in the overall picture of it, in my opinion. And to the extent, you know, you just, you just referenced it as only a down payment. What can, you know, water providers and lawmakers and other decision makers in the state do to close that gap between what's available now and what's needed? I think we have to look at other avenues somehow to either, you know, for the state to provide funding from some, you know, either resource or make it available or make it a priority um, because it is, it's like Bonifer mentioned in their beginning. It's like we put all this investment, all this money in at the beginning, but, you know, we didn't look to main, properly maintain it. And some of that's from the community side fault of it too um, because we weren't properly addressing rates and, Communities out there doing the right thing, but so I don't know. We got to look at a, a variety of different resources and things to bring in additional money because we're not going to do it just with through rates. Uh, we're at a process now because of what we've done over the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years that, you know, rates would be extremely, I mean, they're already getting higher now, but I mean, to do through specific rates. Um, so we're going to need, you know, the government's help and, you know, outside resources and people to come in, maybe think outside the box, or bring uh, groups together to help solve this problem, in my opinion. Well, Tim here is talking about you know, prioritization and how we determine which of the problems we go at first and trying to identify the biggest ones. Um, so with Dinah, I want to go back to something you said before and the work that HHS is doing. When you're considering the work and the universe of, of problems that need to be addressed, how do you go about identifying which ones to go at first? So the data needs that you have for you know, focusing on the big problems. a combination of things, you know, uh, for the first part, you know, our initiatives are community, are um, data driven. And so we're looking at, again, impact and knowing that, you know, similar to when we had um, just the first wave of COVID and we looked at those disparities as it relates to COVID deaths, those are similar. It's an overlay to that Robert Johnson, that Robert Woods Johnson map that shows your zip code correlates with your life expectancy. So again, that allows us to kind of hone in and see, like you've mentioned, small rural communities, you know, there's metropolitan areas where, you know, you have very vulnerable populations that are most impacted. You know, you saw this on the news. This, this isn't anything surprising to any of us that have worked in all of these just different in industries. We know that there are so many factors that influence, you know, health outcomes. And in some areas, they just have a multitude of things that are impacting them environment and socially. 
And so what we're doing is looking at data and then looking at opportunities. You know, you mentioned the infrastructure funds or those were mentioned early on in this conversation. And we're looking at how do we effectively make sure that we have a health lens as we're thinking about this? How do we braid in additional funding? So that means again, bringing um, our health plans, bringing foundations, bringing all of those other partners to the table. So that's really as we're looking at where is there opportunity to utilize funding that may not be typically used for this and we can be creative in that way and bring sources together? How are we using data to really allow us to drill down and see the most impacted areas so that we can prioritize? And then where are there opportunities where it's more of just making sure that we're supporting community in a way that re reduces that disparity? So how are we being more equitable and how we're delivering grants and resources and do our policies reflect that? And Bonifer, a question for you. Um, as part of our series, we were looking at a lot of the sanitary surveys for water systems across Michigan that sort of show what state inspectors see when they, you know, dive into the, the operations and the books. And there were multiple instances where regulators were warning, you know, hey, this water system is not generating enough revenue and we're concerned about you know, the ability to continue delivering water to this community if you're not um, doing that. Um, we've seen it reach the point of crisis in Benton, place like Benton Harbor, but we also saw it in places that haven't hit the headlines, um, Mount Clemens, Marine City. And you mentioned you know, no two water systems are the same, but I'm wondering, we of course didn't have the capacity to look at surveys for every water system in the state how common is that level of underfunding where you literally have regulators coming in and saying this is not going to add up for you long term and we are concerned about you know the fundamental ability of your system to operate on the funds it has right now I don't know that I have a way, I would only be guessing if I uh, took a stab at how pervasive that is. I will say that it's not unheard of and certainly not exclusive to Michigan. Uh, AWWA, the international organization actually has a program that specifically helps communities uh, pay for the early part of funding applications. So Tim had mentioned that sometimes the state revolving fund and the funding process is per cost prohibitive because you have to pay for an engineering pro, um, planning program or um, some other sort of pre-funding work in order to even get access to the application, right? To actually process the application. And recognizing that as an issue, AWWA put together a program that actually covers the cost of that and will do the work um, ahead of the application program so that they can, so that systems can uh, uh, gain access to those funds. Um, I think too, it also um, just a little bit more on the state revolving fund. Um, part of the benefit of the bill that's being considered right now is that it gives Eagle more flexibility in terms of scoring and points and that sort of thing. So that'll that'll help alleviate the barriers to, to funding. Um, I would say the only other thing I would say to, to your question is. I think that Eagle is doing their job, right? That's what we want them to do. We want them to, to raise those early warning flags. Uh, and at that point, it's really, once that's identified, do we as a water community, so AWWA and rural water, do we have the resources that, that are available to help those communities um, fill those gaps and meet those needs? And, and that's kind of what we do on a regular basis. We try and help them fill those gaps. Another question here for Bonifer on the infrastructure assets in Michigan. One of the problems that comes up frequently is this mismatch between how the systems were built and the populations they were built for and how the populations are now. Uh, bigger systems for a smaller population and dupl duplicative systems. Um, one example was in Benton Harbor where a neighboring township that had been buying from the water, water from the city opted to break away and have its own treatment plant. So given that all we know about how hard it is to maintain infrastructure once it's in the ground, this ongoing operations and maintenance of that house that we've bought, um, why does that still happen? And you know, what can be done about duplicative and overcapacity systems? Wow, that's a, uh, that's a tough one. The reality is, I think there are a couple of things. Large customers, um, 
should have a responsibility both moving in and moving out of communities. I think we do a pretty good job of when they move in. We don't really have a plan for when they move out. So that's something we should probably address as we're looking at future policy. Uh, the other is we, we do, there does need to be an acknowledgement that there are some companies who have a very specific requirement in their water chemistry. And so them having their own water treatment is for a very specific reason. So we have to acknowledge that both, both situations are true. Uh, I think part of the solution may be looking at new ways of approaching water systems. Here in Michigan, we have about 1400 community water supplies. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,000 non-community water supplies. Uh, that's a lot of individual entities to manage. Uh, and that's in drinking water specifically. The wastewater side is a little bit better about regionalization. Um, so that may be something that Michigan uh, can take a deeper look at. Uh, it really hasn't come up in Michigan before. I know um, a couple of folks at Eagle have been uh, raising that issue and exploring it with a handful of communities. But I also think to your point, um, you sort of alluded to this, but I'll use the word innovation. There, there's not really an obvious way to scale a water system because it's all um, hard infrastructure, you know, pipes in the ground and you have so many feet of pipe, you can't take it back when, you're, when your population decreases or a company moves out. But that's the innovation we're looking for, right? We need some research into how can we scale water systems so that it can ebb and flow with the population and the businesses coming and going. Thank you. And a question for Nina, you know, you sit at this sort of nexus with health and, you know, um, access to resources like water. And um, there's often talk of, you know, rates, right? We've been talking about that today, rates that aren't high enough to maintain the infrastructure and this need to raise rates to be in line with the actual cost of delivering water. Uh, but we also know that when rates are too high in many communities, it can backfire. People can't afford the water, so they stop paying, which not only defeats the purpose of the rate increase to begin with, but more importantly, cuts off people's access to this essential resource. Um, how do we square that, you know, that need for revenue against the fact that in some places you simply can't afford to fund this infrastructure on your own as a community? I think it's, it's very complicated, you know, and this is something that I, I had a lot of these conversations when I was in my role as Clean Water Public Advocate is, again, we can't continue to raise the rates here, but we know there's a lot that we have to do to invest in our system to make sure that we have quality water. So what are some of the ways that we can do that? Um, we talked about, again, opportunities for, um, I don't know, just some of the barriers is, is applying for federal and state funds to do this. Some of the opportunity is just thinking beyond just um, water affordability and water infrastructure, but thinking more comprehensively like economic development. Are there ways to offset cost here? Are there opportunities to plug in there? It's really about being creative, but there isn't a one size fits all solution. It's about having the capacity within your community and at the local level to have these conversations. You know, we talk a lot about asset management and how that can be a successful way to make sure that communities have, you know, what they need in terms of investing in their infrastructure. But the reality of that is that you're going into communities where you have one person that's fulfilling four or five different roles. You know, maybe they previously had an emergency manager where again, they have half of, the, half of their staff available. They're outsourcing a lot of this to private consultants as it relates to maintaining their infrastructure and even their books like accounting and otherwise. So I think, again, there's an opportunity for us, you know, within this realm of state partners and otherwise and in the private sector, just to really think about collectively, how, are, how can we better support a community? Because that will trickle down and allow us to look at water affordability. You know, when I think about water affordability, I think about the example of, you know, my grandmother, my grandparents were, you know, they lived during the Flint water crisis. They're still in Flint and their bill compared to mine. You know, I lived in East Lansing at the time and I literally was paying a fourth of what they're paying and they're on a fixed income. But we know that there's a lot of maintenance that was needed and a lot of investment in their system. So again, how do you close that gap? And I think it's about looking about looking at, again, the tax base of that of, of different communities how you can help 
reduce those disparities. And that's why I'm excited again about the strategy that we're rolling out because it allows for us to think more comprehensively. We can't fix one thing in a silo. Like all of this stuff is interconnected. So affordability, housing affordability, all of these things are interconnected. I want to tie a bunch of the things we've been talking about into to one question and pitch it to Tim for you know how the rural communities are dealing with this. Our colleague Lester Graham profiled Acme, Michigan, where the local water manager is also in charge of all other public works, and he's the chief of the fire department. Uh, we've talked about wearing lots of hats in these rural communities. And Bonifer mentioned regionalization as a potential opportunity to cut costs. Um, and George Hawkins went and said, we need systems that have lower operating and maintenance costs into the future. So one of the things that has been talked about is regionalization, bringing more communities into uh, union, whether operational or actually tying in their physical assets. What sorts of opportunities do you see and challenges for rural systems in regionalization, Tim? Sure. Um, yeah, regarding small systems, that is a very common problem that you mentioned with like Agni, you know, being that small, you know, there is one person or you know, get a little bit bigger system, you know, where they might have my, my board presence from system 1900 in population. They have four people um, that oversee everything, streets, parks, roads. Um, they're snow plowing at night, their water, their collection system. And wearing all those different hats uh, is, is challenging because, um, like I said, they get pulled in different directions all the time. And, you know, there's continuing regulations that continue to come down, um, which understand the reasoning behind them and that. But it doesn't matter what size system you have, you still have to comply. Like Acme still has the same regulations that Detroit does. You know, there's no, no difference. You still have the same compliance. They don't have a lot of the understanding to comply with these rules and make sure they're doing things correctly. So it, it's a major challenge and it impacts these systems and it's been a major impact in, on these systems. Um, as for regionalization, you know, that's, I think that's a, you know, an opportunity um, for Michigan for these smaller systems. Um, just as reference to our other rural water associations, there's a rural water association in every state. Um, we're part of with, affiliated with National Rural Water Association too, but there's several state, a lot of quite a few states that have their small systems are real, are regionalized. Um, Kentucky was one that I forget how many years ago, but they you know forced like all systems under a certain size to you know into some regionalization. But you know forcing them into regionalization is going to lead to problems and issues, and that's part of the things that we have issues now that challenges I think to regionalization in the future is you know we've had our system set up this way for this long so. You know, they have their autonomy, you know, well, you know, they don't want to lose that over their own system. You know, it's their identity for their towns too, and those things in those regards. So those are going to be challenges to overcome. So we're not going to be able to just go out there and say, you have to do this because you're going to get pushback, you know, when they force it. So we're going to have to think of things outside the box of things like somehow incentivize, incentivize things for these communities to potentially look at it and how the benefits will be greater to them down the road. Because I mean, it makes, you know, it's just simple, you know, economic sense to do that. You know, if you're have 800 customers or you get three or four small towns together and you're dealing with now 3,000 to 4,000, you know, it, you know, makes a big difference in that. And, you know, times and scale, more access to resources, you know, higher funding levels. So, I mean, that's something that I think, you know, it's an opportunity for us down the road and something that, you know, we're going to have to take a hard look at here in Michigan for these small systems, as we mentioned previously, because we have a declining population, you know, especially the further North you get and up into the UP, especially, I mean, those small towns are, you know, there's no population increases. Once you get outside, you know, Marquette region, you know, maybe Escanaba, Sioux, but, you know, you get outside of those areas and the vast majority of population in Michigan as a whole is declining. You have a handful of areas that are increasing. So, you know, it's going to be a challenge going forward when you're losing that population base. Um, and that's, you know, an avenue that I think we need to look at and take advantage of, but there are going to be those challenges that we're going to face doing that. So. Before we move on, do you have any good examples of a, a healthy marriage between two systems that consolidated or regionalized that we could hold up as you know, this is how it can be done? <laughs> I've not, not recently off the top of my head that I've heard of. Um, I know, you know, some have been like some when they've done that has been like that. I've known have been new systems that put in like in townships where we've seen. I haven't really, you know, known of any two communities that have merged currently I can think of off the top of my head right now, but most ones I've seen that emerge or bill authorities are coming in for newer systems that, you know, from townships and that, that we've been involved with and seen. And, you know, it works when you get that. And then, 
you know, it helps a little bit oversight too, helps when you get that too, because instead of having a full council over, you know, you each community has points one person and, you know, you might have a little better view and oversight of the system than council, you know, they don't have a full understanding of running a system. And, you know, their interest is thinking they're doing the right thing by keeping their rates down for the residents when ultimately you might not be. Um, another question for you, Tim, while we've got the, the microphone on you, um, sure. you know, you mentioned the, both the watershed moment with this water funding and also the fact that it is just a down payment. Um, and I hear a lot of talk about, you know, this is, this is sort of a one-time opportunity for now at least. And, um, so we need water systems. We need to be spending this money smartly, especially knowing that, you know, it's not enough to do everything. What is meant by that? And from where you sit, you know, looking at um, water systems in our state and, and their issues, what are your fears about how we could spend it unwisely? Um, it is, um, hopefully it's not a one-time thing. Hopefully maybe, you know, additional people realize that we do have to make further investment in this down the road. Um, but um, my interpretation of spend smartly is that, you know, we need to focus on, you know, you know, some, you know, all rural systems, but some that are, you know, the older systems that have a lot of infrastructure issues. Um, we need to focus, you know, because sometimes smaller systems get overlooked and the funding, they get missed out on the funding. So putting away um, for that, spending smartly, also making a focus this, this can't be spent towards new systems or expanding systems. You know, we need to focus on our current infrastructure that we have in place. And that's, you know, that's the biggest fear is that misusing it like, hey, well, we, want to put in a new system or expand our current system. And, you know, we're going to put some money towards that. It's like, no, we got so much infrastructure in place now that we need to put a focus on the infrastructure that we, we, we currently have, you know, I can see, you know, one thing, if they do a new system, like we've worked with this community where the health department's been, you know, telling them that they've, you know, they've got failing septic systems and they can't meet code with new systems, but, um, <clears throat> but, you know, putting a new system in for something like that, that's where you could put nukes, you're replacing, you know, old septic, you know, taking care of a problem there where because septic's leach going into the river, uh, it's causing a problem with human waste. But, but outside of that for new system, I mean, we need to invest in our current infrastructure that we have. Um, and that's where I feel putting it smartly, you know, the most challenged systems and systems that have the most need, um, you know, need to focus on those areas, I think, in that regard. I have a similar yet slightly different <clears throat> question for Bonifer here. Uh, when we're talking about infrastructure and water, we usually talk about the hard infrastructure, the concrete and the steel. Um, but I've heard a lot of concerns from water systems about the human aspect of this, the workforce, the people that are gonna be doing the work to keep the water clean and you know, fixing your pipe when it breaks. For workforce development, looking at retirements that are coming up, uh, how are water systems going about meeting the labor needs to keep these systems operating. Wow, you have a time, that's so timely. The, uh, we knew that the silver tsunami, so to speak, was coming. Uh, COVID accelerated that, right? There are a lot of people who just said, okay, now's the time, I'm out. Uh, so we're already seeing that labor shortage. Uh, and it, it was already an issue before COVID, but definitely now. Organizations like ours and, and Tim's are uh, trying to develop workforce development programs. Um, they're, they're in their infancy, you know, still in the idea stage. Part of the challenge is uh, you have to be willing to pay people a living wage in order to get them to take the kind of responsibility we're asking them to take on. You think about what's required of a water operator. Um, you don't have to have a college degree, which is great but you gotta understand basic math and you gotta sit for an exam to get your license from the state. And if you're in a smaller system, there's even more requirements because somebody has to be the operator in charge. Uh, so attracting people is related to this conversation we're sort of dancing around, which is water affordability, right? Um, and it's we can't continue to only fund our water systems through rates. There has to be other funding mechanisms um, currently, communities are doing um, loans and grants and millages, but there has to be other options. Uh, we've got to look at the way that we fund the entire water system, not just infrastructure, but the entire water system in order for this to be sustainable and address the workforce issue. That workforce issue, as I was reporting on my stories in this series, 
came up twice at two different water plants that I was visiting. One thought that they had to end the interview because of um, a job interview that afternoon and, and their only candidate was a no-show. And um, the other one had had like one or two candidates for a position that they were posting. And so it's been interesting to see that as a uh, sub theme as we were reporting on something entirely you know, different um, through this series. Um, I wanted to pitch a question to Nina, you know, talking about water affordability and how it relates to these other themes of funding our infrastructure and where the money comes from. Uh, Detroit made headlines last year when uh, the mayor extended the water shutoff moratorium through the end of this year and vowed to find a permanent solution. Um, but the clock is ticking. Uh, I'm curious, are there conversations, you know, are we on track, first of all, in, in Detroit? And are there conversations out going, on, going at the state about a more widespread strategy on shutoffs and, you know, how to prevent that from happening? Thanks for that question. Um, so I've done some research on that and just wanted to make sure that there was a public um, dialogue. It, Mayor Duggan announced an extension in February of this year, just saying that he was going to extend it. And there's some work being done in terms of assembling a task force. So I think we have a little bit longer than we anticipated through the end of this year, a little longer just to make sure that, again, he had the right people at the table. I do want to make the clear delineation between state and local. And so we are not involved in those conversations. You know, this is a local a local body that has made this decision. But what we're doing in terms of statewide and through the governor's office is just really making sure that, again, the um, infrastructure funds are going to be utilized effectively across the state. And so there was development of the Michigan Infrastructure Office that is really looking at strategically how we can best support communities in getting this money deployed. And so that's going to impact affordability across the state as it relates to water rates, just again, providing this funding. I know there's been a lot of questions in terms of how do we make best use of it? And again, I think that goes down to acknowledging that there are communities that are in need that will need some technical assistance and how we can best support that. You know, when I was in the Office of the Clean Water Public Advocate, one of the things that we were working on with um, the Mott Foundation is looking at, again, how we can provide that technical assistance in terms of just applying for grants. We know that, again, there's diminished capacity as it relates to staffing within um, local water departments. And how can we, in, in turn, help support acknowledging what you need to maintain your infrastructure and then also looking at applying for those funds to meet those needs? And that's something where, again, as state partners, we can help reduce that disparity by working collectively with local partners to make sure that we don't create a larger disparity because we have this funding and we know that some communities are positioned to apply right away and others aren't. So again, I think more broadly, we're looking at water affordability in that way. It also ties into, again, I talk about the social terms of health strategy, water affordability, housing affordability, all of these things impact health, health outcomes. Um, water affordability leads to lack of water access. And we know, like, at the, I can't even say the height of COVID, but during our waves of COVID, you know, water access has been key in terms of hygiene and health for the community, not just at the individual level, but at a community level. So these are things collectively that we're looking at and how we can best support the community as a whole. And thinking about, again, the way that we provide funding and our policies that we have in place to support these mechanisms. Great. Thanks, Nina. We're going to turn to listener questions now. There are a lot of them, as I see. So we'll put a premium on brevity, succinct answers here as we try and get through as many of these in the next 15 minutes. So I'll start, I guess this is an infrastructure question for Bonifer or Tim. Uh, is it possible and feasible to right size the water infrastructure in locations where it's too large for remaining populations? And are there any places where this has happened in Michigan you could point to? And I guess, what is right-sizing? I mean, I'll just jump in. I mean, I think, I mean, that's pretty difficult. I mean, you, that's a big political hit you're going to take because, you know, you're going to have to, to right-size, you know, downsize the system when, you know, due to population leaving and businesses leaving, that means you have to basically take off and cut away part of the system. And so you're going to force people to move, potentially businesses to move. So that's going to be, you know, a lot of political <laughs> will and strength to 
you know, try to pull something like that off. It's just, I mean, just because of the size of what you're dealing with, everything's underground and the way systems are set up, it's, that's challenging. I don't know if Bonifer has anything else to add really to that. Or. Yeah, I think the only thing we could do in terms of right sizing is find technologies that actually um, <clears throat> address the quote unquote dead ends or the, uh, the where the waters pool and, and aren't in use. Maybe there's technology we can develop to divert the water so that those system those parts of the system are no longer accessible, but you can't really unbuild the system. Here's a sort of, um, you know, just a, a fundamental question about how rates are set, and I think it's relevant because we do see water use uh, declining pretty significantly over the past 20 years. Um, Someone says, it's been my experience that when a community success successfully reduces water use by taking conservation efforts, water rates increase rather than decrease. Why is that? I wonder if maybe Bonifer, do you have a, a way to explain that? Uh, I'll go quick, but I think um, uh, Tim is probably better suited for the question. I would say um, the funding has to come from somewhere. And right now, the primary source of funding for water systems is the rates, Tim. Yeah, I mean, exactly, Monifer, it, it is. I mean, the rates are from the system and you gotta remember, all right, we're, you know, conserving water, less use, but we still have all the infrastructure that's still in place. The plant's still there, all the pipes are still in lines, you know, all that hard fixed infrastructure assets that the community has with their water system is still in place. So that still has to be maintained. So when you're losing, you know, conserving water that, and you're just getting revenue based off rates, that means less money is coming in. If you're producing less water, providing less water, less revenue is coming in, but you still have the same fixed costs that aren't changing at all in that regard. So to offset that, the only way right now, since it's by fees, we have to increase water, water rates for that purpose. So. All right, here we have a question about septic systems. Uh, it's a, looking at on-site septic systems as part of our infrastructure, how do we get the money appropriated to fix failing septic systems into the hands of homeowners? There's always been a legal barrier to state funds loaned directly to individuals. How can we fix this? Any uh, septic system so, funding people? I can, so I can speak to that more broadly. So some of the funding that we provide to community action agencies can be used for that way, especially because it's a health hazard. And so um, we, we don't have a lot of discretionary funds where we're able to do that, but when we do have those funds, we want to make sure that, again, at the community level, those funds are available. Like I said, it's a limited amount, so I'm not saying that, you know, it's going to solve the problem, but um, I think that's one of the ways that we can address these, these um, issues on an individual level. It's just really, again, how we support our community partners that interface with customers that experience these issues. I'll just jump in real quick, and I, I don't know a lot about it, so I can't offer a whole lot, but there is funding um, that's going to the USDA, to each state, um, to the state conservationist specifically, that addresses some, uh, some aspects of water protection as it relates to septic systems. That's all I know. <laughs> so I can't give you more details, but there are programs that are out there. They're just not very widely publicized. Um, so definitely something if it impacts you to explore. Here's a question. Um, I'll popcorn this to anyone who wants to answer it because I don't think it you know, necessarily caters to a specific expertise. But um, someone says water's true cost. Essentially, the customers, the consumers need to pay for the true value of their water. How do we change public perception in a water rich state like Michigan? I'll jump in. I mean, that's the that's the hardest part right now. I mean, you know, some of the things that we've done with our national water and things like that, you can see uh, our logo, it's quality on tap, stuff like that. But we have to do a better job of educating the public. Um, that's part of the problem of we're in where we are now. Part of the reason why we are where we are now, because for years, you know, we provided safe, clean, potable drinking water to our customers and people, you know, had no idea or thought where it came from. You know, they think all water should be free. Well, sure, go down to any lake, stream, you can grab as much water as you want and bring it, but then you gotta bring it back home and treat it. You know, they don't realize all the infrastructure and the co true costs that are involved in there. And we've done, you know, a poor job doing that, you know, marketing ourselves to the public. 
you know, unfortunately, you know, bottled water, you know, who 30 years ago, who would have thought about bottled water being out there? You know, they've done a phenomenal job of marketing that and in that area. So there's, there's something that, you know, there's programs and stuff we do from, you know, source water protection, groundwater protection that communities are doing. Those are areas where they can help to do things to help educate the public. But, you know, those are things that we got to make a major focus too, besides just, you know, you know, providing clean, safe, potable drinking water, we got to educate the public on it because they take it for granted, um, unfortunately, here. Can I add to that, too? I think public education is key, but I think for communities that and individuals who don't have water access or, or who have water quality issues, they understand the value of water, not going to your tap and feeling comfortable washing your hands, cleaning your dishes, not understanding, again, you know, the dynamic between how it can impact health, what you can do safely, what you can't. They can, and I've had a lot of conversations about people valuing it, but not really knowing again how we can collectively come together in that space. You know, I feel like within water, sometimes it's very siloed. You have your water um, suppliers, you have your regulators, and then you have your community. Well, again, this is a comprehensive process, um, issue, and we need a comprehensive solution. So, how do we bring groups together? So. I would say sometimes until you experience these issues, you may take it for granted, but I do want to make sure that we acknowledge that communities experiencing this definitely know the value of water. It's a challenge that they experience making sure again, and it impacts, um, you know, their psychological health, to, psych, psychological health and just thinking about, you know, again, what's safe for them. And it's like for years to come, like just thinking about some of the conversations that I've had with Flint residents and again, some folks still using bottled water to bathe their children. There's a, a longstanding issue that arises when one, we don't provide that public education, but then also we have to acknowledge again, like there's, there's so much that can be lost in that space if we're not being proactive and then we're not also coming on the back end and acknowledging that there are a lot of people that appreciate water, but there are barriers to it. And so we have to be more proactive in making sure, again, water is affordable and that, again, water suppliers have the resources needed to maintain their system because it's not just about getting water, it's about getting quality water. Great. And we have a question here, maybe on the more technical side, but perhaps we have some municipal representatives that are interested in federal funding. Um, so there's a question about what types of technical assistance can federal agencies provide to state and local governments uh, to ensure dollars are well spent, but also to uh, allow them access or you know, get them access to some of these, these federal funds. Any takers there? With, uh, with the federal infrastructure bill, there is a set aside for technical assistance to utilities to help them prepare uh, applications for federal grants. I don't know, Bonifer, if anyone at AWWA is working on assisting utilities in this aspect. Yeah, so um, not specifically um, on this aspect. I'll say that uh, I guess there are two um, aspects to technical assistance. I guess I interpreted this question a little differently. There is the technical assistance helping water systems to prepare for <clears throat> applying for funding. And uh, Tim definitely knows more about that than I do. There's what I thought the question was um, getting at was the technical assistance for municipalities. And uh, that's a little bit different because the water departments are, you know, uh, they're beholden to their local leaders. And I think that that is as important as the technical assistance in applying for funding is making sure that the leaders, the local leaders who are actually making the decisions about rates and other things actually understand um, the limitations of the money uh, how the money has to be managed and how it has to be spent. They, they are part of this process and they need to be brought in. Yeah. I don't know how like to say, you know, from federal level to make, you know, talk to their, you know, people that oversee the programs in the state, you know, what the best provide. I know one thing back, if you want to go back to the RF funding um, years ago, they actually provided your road development, you know, um, provided, you know, a program that, you know, our national water actually received it where they had, um, circuit riders that went around, you know, each state, we had two in Michigan that went around and basically during that time period helped these systems, you know, apply for the funding that's available out there, um, you know, go through the process and all those type things, you know, it was a short term, you know, lasted those programs, I think lasted a total of two years um, when we had those. So, you know, potentially maybe 
you know, things like those again, potentially could be a, you know, a way for, to get technical assistance communities to help access the funding. Um, but I think, it's, you know, some way if the federal government can, you know, educate the state people that are allocating the funding. I mean, I'm not sure about that because that's not an area of expertise for me, but what Bonifer, we're here temptation, technical assistance. Uh, we receive funding from USDA. So we have, you know, circuit riders, water and wastewater that travel around the state and assist technical assistance with basic operations, compliance, issues, asset management, that's 10,000 systems population, 10,000 less, because that's who rural development's eligible to fund is only communities that are under 10,000 population. So those are communities where we have people around that travel around the state, you know, help them with any issues from operation maintenance and financial issues with their system to help them through. But like my information too, they're still beholden to their council to move forward with anything. You know, we can help them with so much and say, well, here's where things you need to do, unless the council moves forward with it, you know, there's not a lot more that can be done. I know we're coming up on the hour. Um, Amber, do we have time for one more question? Or, or I'm so a question. This is again a question from Brett and myself, but I think it's a good one to close on if we can be very succinct. You know, we didn't get here overnight. Um, it took a lot of conscious and unconscious decisions over decades to underinvest, you know, to make decisions about where and how we develop. For each of you, what do you see as the most important thing Michigan can do today? to make sure that we are not back in the same place in a couple of decades. And if you're able to be short, that'd be great. I'll, I'll be the quickest, I think. Uh, I think the most important thing is that we as Michiganders need to engage our legislators and put pressure on them to continue the funding. This can't be a one-time investment. It has to be an ongoing investment or we're just gonna be back here five years from now. I think the one thing to add to what Bonham for saying too, once you know, we, we're gonna need additional investment down the road without a doubt. But the other thing too is, you know, we need to make sure these communities then are practicing asset management. Cause we see it in communities right now and even small communities that are currently doing asset management and have been doing it for a number of years. You know, they have the money set aside, their rates are not astronomical. I mean, it can be done, but we need to get to the point where infrastructure upgrade and fix before you know, we can make it going through asset management and handle it that way. So like Bonifer said, it can't be a one-time investment. I'll keep it short. Um, strategic partnerships, I think that's the key, investing in communities so that they can invest in the infrastructure. Again, I think there's a lot of opportunity for funding and state, and we can continue to ask and receive that. But we want to make sure that we're being strategic in how we're utilizing that and having all of our key partners at the table. Well, thank you all for being here. And um, thanks to everyone who's listening in. And I will let Amber take it away. Thanks so much, Kelly. And I just thank you to all of you for participating today. This has been a fascinating uh, discussion. I know I've learned a lot. and I'm sure many of you have as well. A uh, special thank you to Tim, Bonifer, and Nina for participating as our, as our special guest today. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with this group and answering so many questions. Also, thank you to Kelly, Brett, George Hawkins, Carl Ganter, and the whole Circle of Blue team. We really appreciate you. This has been, we couldn't do this event without all of you. So thank you so much for, for being our partners in this. Special thank you to the Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation and the Bosch Community Fund for their sponsorship of this event series, our, this bi-monthly event series. Just a reminder that we will be posting a recording of this conversation in Bridge, Michigan this week. So you can visit bridgemi.com to watch the recording or share with anyone who you think might find it interesting, useful, beneficial. So basically everyone you know. Uh, just a uh, reminder that we will be resuming this bi-monthly event series in July. An announcement will be coming soon from Bridge and Circle of Blue. We hope you have a wonderful remainder of your day. And thanks again for joining us. We look forward to talking with you in July. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.